Okay. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen and bromeliad enthusiasts to the La Bologna Valley Bromeliad Society Zoom presentation with me, Ken Simpson, the speaker tonight. Welcome to our members and guests. Thank you all for joining. Paul Nakamura has mooted all participants for this presentation. Please stay mooted during the presentation. Adjust the view on your screen in your Zoom window for either speaker or gallery. I will take questions during this presentation. You may unmute yourself for your question only. When finished, please mute yourself again. I'm a 71 year old California native. I started raising orchids, bromeliads, and platyceriums with my father in 1961 at 11 years old. In the early 1970s, I met most of the top collectors in the West Los Angeles geographical area. Some were officers and members of the LBVBS. At 25 years old, I was elected as president and vice president from 1975 to 1977. I'm the current vice president. My love of nature and collecting started when I was very young. By the early 1980s, I started collecting insects, moths, and butterflies after a month long UCLA extension trip called Tropical Ecology, the Amazon, to the headwaters of the Amazon in Peru. The famous botanist Mildred Mathias was our head teacher and the seven and a half acre botanical garden at UCLA is named after her. Um, in the early 1960s, I trained three years for gymnastics competition and competed three years varsity gymnastics in high school. And I was on the diving team my first semester in college. I obtained my bachelor's from Claremont Men's College and my master's from the California State University Fullerton in experimental psychology. In June of 1967, I enlisted in the United States Coast Guard Reserves and started my active duty in October of 1968. I retired from my nearly 40 year career as an expert witness as an industrial real estate broker and expert witness in my mid 60s. I've always enjoyed sports and at the age of 56, made the All-American ski team as a rookie shooter and in 2009 shot two perfect scores at the World Championships. My two adult sons, Kevin and Keith, are both third generation Eagle Scouts and along with my daughter, Coral, have all developed a love of nature and plants. Uh, this was a program I pulled out of my records showing my farewell address and, uh, in 1977 and Paul Isley took over the club's leadership. Uh, the La Bologna Valley Bromeliad Society is a nonprofit organization. Attendance at our Zoom presentations is free to all bromeliad enthusiasts. Bromeliads grow extremely well in Southern California coastal regions. Temperatures range from 30 degrees to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Living by the ocean in a desert generates humidity. Sunny California grows beautiful bromeliads. Well, it's not always sunny in Southern California. However, your collection can look great after a rain. Bromeliads, platyceriums, cactus, and cycads growing side by side. I grow on the ground, on benches, on my fences, and on the shade structure I have, if you see the Tillandsias hanging there. I grow a lot of Neerogelias on gravel in my yard. And uh, I think of raising bromeliads as living art from the ground up through the vertical space to the canopy and growing above ground level allows for more plants and your personal artistic design. There. Now, stare at that yellow inflorescence. While staring, your peripheral vision will see concentric white circles that are connected. If you take a look, you'll see the circles. There's so much going on in this picture of a Bilbergia bloom. We need a botanist to explain all the parts shown in scientific nomenclature. This is an Acmea ray curvata and changes color from green to fiery red at anthesis. And thesis in the American English botany is a period or act of expansion in flowers, especially the maturing of the stamens. 
And in British English, it has a little different definition. So here's the Acmea Ray Pravada. It's just a beautiful change from the, the green to the full red when it's in bloom. Alcantaria imperialis, also called Verisia imperialis for many years. Giving context to the size of the emerging inflorescence is my hand. You can see it's a very robust plant and flower. And here's the inflorescence emerging. It grows almost three more feet. And in, in my opinion, this is the largest, most complex, colorful and impressive bromeliad in my collection and easy to grow in our backyards. This mother plant has been gone four years and I'm growing a few of its three foot wide pups and likely they'll be mature in four more years to bloom. This is a close up shot of the vibrant, waxy and colorful inflorescence. This is a uh, Alcantaria odorata, it, sometimes called a uh, Verisia also, it has beautiful powdery leaves. And here's a close up of the flower. The ananas or pineapple looks prettier than the ones you buy from the market, but there's not as much fruit to eat. And this is a very variegated albo marginata. Now, don't be afraid to get up close to your plant's blooms. Look at them, don't forget your glasses to see the detail. Uh, this is an unknown bilbergia. Here's a classic bilbergia hallelujah. It's a great combination of colors and splotches. I, everybody should have one in their collection. Um, here's a Guzmania Denise, nice, pretty, medium-sized plant. Now, on the right is Neorogelia castigata, which uh, has purple leaves in the cup. And all the Neorogelias have very colorful cups good for close-up photography, as we will see in the next series of photographs. Uh, any are suitable for the close-ups that follow. So flowers from the cups of the neorogelias are colorful and vibrant. They beg for beautiful close-up pictures. This is a neorogelia, that neorogelia concentrica in bloom. The next group of pictures focuses on close-up images of Neorogelia cups, not in flower. The afternoon sun and the camera angle make the images so artistic and unusual visually. Every picture in this PowerPoint presentation has been taken with my iPhone in my backyard. Now in this picture, do you see a face inside the cup? See the nose in the middle above the crooked open mouth smile with the tongue and the lips on the lower left. Some form of sunglasses covering the alien's eyes. You see that? If you see a face in this picture, do you want to share your thoughts in, a question, in our later questions and answers? Or do you want to think of seeing a psychologist to help you think this through? So thank you, Chester Skotak, for your hybrids. And thank you for being our speaker last year. Chester's done an incredible job with his hybrids. Uh, the ones that I showed were all in my collection. I pulled out a few individual ones. Uh, Invincible on the left, Jet Setter in the middle, Scarface on the right. Um, the pictures do justice, but when you see them up close in daylight, it's even better. Here's a Hellacious, Hypershock, and Pizzazz. His uh, creativity and variety is just unbelievable, and almost any of his plants are fantastic to have in your collection. 
This is a uh, awesome tiger. Another SCOTAC cross, Neurogelia hellfire. This is not a SCOTAC that I'm aware of, but it's a Neurogelia Johannes lime. It's large growing, uh, it likes sun, and it uh, matures with those really beautiful pink tips. Um, this is Neurogelia Linda Car Cathcart. Um, Tropiflora in Florida. The owner of that hybridized this for his wife, Linda. Here's another really nice, colorful Neurogelia Malbec. Now on the left is Neurogelia Picasso. After losing some of its traits compared to the parent on the right, it's uh, not uncommon for some of the hybrids to lose some of their genetic traits and end up reverting to something in the past or combination. But this, <laughs> these two pups were taken off the same plant. I really like Neurogelia pinstripe. It's uh, beautiful stripes and the green and pinks. Uh, come really well together. Neurogelia voodoo doll, colorful, vibrant, bright, and light, it's gorgeous. Now, the Tillandsias displayed here are mounted on the branches of a dead grape plant, making a beautiful presentation. Uh, the next slide is a close-up of a Tillandsia and this Tillandsia is in focus. The inflorescence is spectacular, in focus with the background leaves out of focus. Inflorescence, the complete flower head of a plant, including stems, stalks, bracts, and flowers. This is not a very large Tillandsia, Tillandsia adriana, but it has a lot of distinctive detail making it really pretty. Now this is a hybrid Adriana with a Funkiana and the flowers haven't pushed through yet, but uh, it's very pretty when it's flowering as well as changing colors. This is a uh, Tillandsia Bahia, which is a Rothii times fasciculata magnifica and uh, it's probably, the bloom's probably about two feet high. It's a rather large Tillandsia. This is Tillandsia B Coriel, and the left side shows the inflorescence emerging. And then a little later, it gets mature, um, beautiful colors, texture, and a little purple flower. Now, I, I know this is Tillandsia cyanea, but it's been renamed to Wallisia cyanea, and it has, a, as a common name, pink quill, native to the rainforest in Ecuador. It's a forever classic species that should be in everybody's collection. So here's a picture of Tillandsia dorotii King Kong. And the one on the left was taken a few months ago and the one on the right, you can see the inflorescence coming up and it's a Saxitalis variety because it has these, the flowers were formed not on the main stock but on these little offshoots to the side. This is a Tillandsia Ursulisiana. Um, I like all the trichomes and its uh, texture. Of course, you know, when you water these, they turn green because the water gets absorbed through the, the white. Um, Tillandsia fasciculata tropiflora, um, which is uh, spectacular, 
It's huge, it's heavy. Um, this is it on the actual plant. Um, the leaves turn a little reddish on the ends and it makes a really spectacular display. I, I lost the label on this fasciculata, but some of them get very large and have these really long spikes that come up and others are much smaller, but they're all, and some are green, some are red, some are really colorful, but they're very easy to grow and uh, fit into collections real well. So this is a Tillandsia ionantha by Van Heining guy. There are so many variations in size, shape, and color that collecting Ionanthas alone is a fun sub-collection. Here's a little, uh, another close-up with many pups. And then I have a little area where I hang a whole bunch of them that I'm looking to mature into bigger clumps. They uh, stay colorful all the time, and they're larger and thicker than most other Ionanthas. Here's a, another close up showing a, the different color of the leaves and the flowers. Very easy to grow and very rewarding. Now, this is a Tillandsia Ionantha cross with a Tans Tillandsia tectorum that I named impossible. Um, it is impossible. When people hybridize, they say the plant might look like one or the other or anywhere in between. So I took the, the tectorum and the ionantha and I strapped them together with some fishing line. And this is my impossible hybrid. Uh, Tillandsia Elisco Monticola has a really large bulbous inflorescent growing from that really neat pinkish green to a more sort of iridescent green. Here's a real pretty uh, passiflora. Here's a pruinosa in bloom, a clump that I've probably had 30 years. It's never gotten really large, but it's uh, really spectacular when it's blooming. Here's a couple other varieties of pruinosa. Um, I'm not sure the one on the left, but the one on the right is a Colombian variety. Tillandsia straminea, a species and variety here has very fragrant flowers and the deep purple is really beautiful in sunlight. Here's another straminea variety that has different color flowers to enjoy. And when you have a plant that has uh, multiple plants on it, um, it'll send out many blooms and fill the air with nice fragrance and add some color to your garden. Uh, Tillandsia streptophylla, um, you give it more water, the leaves here are less curly and the more hydrated they are, they um, look more like this. I have some that are uh, very stringy looking that are watered less. So when your Tillandsias grow for many years and grow into clumps, we tend to form into balls and uh, they make really nice displays hanging, especially uh, when they stay together and don't fall apart in the rain. You know, we had this recent rain and I've had a couple affected by it, but uh, you wanna make sure they dry out and don't water them in between rains. Here's a couple more that really display nicely when they're hanging. Um, as your plants mature, 
they will fill up what you're growing them on. The one on the right has a cork bark that I used to nail to redwood, two by two redwood and make little trees out of them and uh, fill them up with tillandsias. And uh, as they get larger, like on the left, you wanna make sure that you have room for them to expand into. Now, this is a section where I have a bunch of different Tillandsia tectorums, and I've probably got like maybe five different varieties here. Um, the one in the left is a coalescence variety, and uh, there's other ones that I'm not sure. I know I've got some from Ecuador and Colombia, and they and they do grow into nice balls also. This is a picture I took at night and the one in the center is sending out a rather large and long inflorescence. Some of the tectorums have a much stubbier bloom, but this one uh, has, a, has a long inflorescence. And this is the coalescent form. It's taken about 10 years to grow into multiple heads like this. My original started with just one. Now, I just love Varicias. They're, I love them all, but Varicias uh, are so colorful and the way they look when they grow is uh, fantastic. Uh, I also love Neerogelias and Salanzias, especially Chester's. Uh, some of the ones that I'm going to show here were uh, hybrids by David Fell from in Hawaii. So I keep certain plants together um, by genus, and I think it they look good when they're similar and they show off the different colors. So I've got a few that I'm going to show you by name. This is a uh, Abigail Gold. Chartreuse Goose, Chocolate Raspberry, Crouching Tiger. And, and these are large plants. I mean, we're looking at when they mature, you know, three feet wide, a couple feet tall, so that you can tell how much larger this is next to some of the smaller ones by the side. Lavender Lady, just spectacular, vibrant colors. I really enjoy growing them. Uh, this is Luscious Lady. Ocean Mist. I don't think this is a fell, but Ospenae, Gruberi, Josephi, Joseph, sorry, Josepha, Leon. Um, it's got a lot going on in the leaves and I enjoy the patterns and stripes and colors. That this was the cultivar discovered by Chester. Chester discovered it? Yes. Good. Uh, this is uh, Pink Dreams. This is uh, Strawberry Ice Cream. Neurogelia Strange Brew. And this is uh, Wild Jean. Not our gene in our club. Now, green anole lizards are seen frequently in my backyard. Green's a misnomer because they can change colors, prompting some people to erroneously call them chameleons. You never know when they're going to show up, but they tend to come out more when I water. Sometimes I see them, but when I water, they sort of scurry from one 
platycerium to another. And this little guy is a bit of a ham for a lizard and they seem to be semi-friendly at times. Now this is another one, but it's on a dickia and you notice a different color um, and it's adjusted to the background is fitting in camouflaged. Now, we have all kinds of different things that show up in the garden. Uh, this is an alligator lizard that's on top of some of my uh, eusenoides. This is a common morning cloak butterfly taking a rest on a platycerium fertile frond. Uh, here's a swallowtail um, holding on under my shade cloth. There's a lot of different varieties of swallowtails. This is a, sp a sphinx moss that uh, is in a cup of one of my bromeliads. Um, I, I'm not sure what it is, but this moth is seen a lot here in Southern California and one way to tell the difference between a moth and a butterfly is that the antenna on the moth is much thicker and a little furry back on it. They're pretty colorful. So here's a Tillandsia pruinosa. And um, what's really interesting is that I looked at it a couple of times and said, what's going on on that plant? And when I looked more closely, this is a moth that I've highlighted with its wings wrapped around the pruinosa and it just blends in amazingly with that. Now, we also find black widow spiders. Uh, this one is dead on her back. And uh, one way to tell if they're wi black widows is that their webs aren't symmetrical like Charlotte's web. Um, they are disoriented, whoops, and thick. Um, this is the backside of a shovel that I have in my work area. And then you can see the Black Widow uh, hourglass, but those little white balls that look like naval mines from World War II, those are their egg sacs. And um, I get rid of egg sacs and Black Widows whenever I can, but in Southern California and other places, we have Brown Widows that have infiltrated Southern California and moved out some of the black widow population. And they vary in their model brown and uh, which tops their abdomen coloration. And they have an orange hour glass on the bottom. Here's an example of its strange modeling. Um, I've walked out in my garden at night and walked right into an orb weaver spider. They're large, like as big as a half a dollar. And uh, you don't really want to walk into them at night. Now, here's a praying mantis. Um, I caught it praying to the, bromeli to the bromeliad gods for healthy plants and brilliant colors. Now, this isn't good. There's a big hole in the rhizome of this plant. And it's one that I imported um, about eight years ago from a guy in Florida. And uh, you can see the, that the uh, striped black weevil showed up with the hole and uh, you don't wanna have those in your collection. Whenever you get a new plant that's not local, um, and I know it's a dirty word now, but you want to quarantine them and keep them away from the rest of your collection so they don't transmit um, weevils or um, scale or mealybugs, as an example. Now, seen here is a morning dove nest with two eggs. Um, their nests are much less complex than some other birds. This picked up some loose twigs and Tillandsia eusenoides stolen from some of my clumps to form the nest compared to, uh, which you'll see later, the hummingbird nest. And here's the mom with its two little chicks in the 
platycerium hulahans. So even though they are precious, they leave a lot of you know what in the nest. So as the old saying goes, clean out the poop for the health of the plant. Whoops. Once the babies fly the coop. They're cute little birds. Now, here's a mother hummingbird sitting on her nest of eggs. I took it through a small telescope with my camera from my second floor window, looking down using my iPhone. And there's a little chick. That's uh, that nest, as you can see, is like really well formed and tight. And this is on uh, a Tillandsia incarnata. Another year, another hummingbird nest with two babies on Tillandsia incarnata again. So hummingbirds really like Tillandsia flower nectar. Um, they're around all the time. Um, here's one stopping, getting a little bit closer, but it's a different Tillandsia than the previous slide. And this one is getting ready to taste the nectar um, from a bilbergia. It's, and here is a sweet taste of success. You can see that its beak is down the flower and uh, it's really enjoying itself. Now, if you look to the right and see the blue arrow, uh, that's a Tillandsia mima inflorescence. And after giving birth and hatching babies and feeding them, the old lady needs a rest on this large flower. Shapes, curves, textures, and motion found in platyceriums, also known as staghorn or elkhorn ferns, make them very beautiful to me. Here's a new fertile frond on a platycerium, and it meets my four criteria mentioned in the prior slide for, uh, for being beautiful. So here is a 40-year-old platycerium superbum. Uh, platycerium is a genus of 19 fern species. And what's interesting is that some of these do not send out any pups, they only can be uh, started by spore. And there's about four or five of them out of the 19 that do not vegetatively reproduce. Um, this platycerium andinum is the only platycerium found in the Americas. It lives as an understory epiphyte in tropical dry forests in Peru and Bolivia, um, makes a really nice display. This is a Platycerium diversifolium. It's a larger growing variety with broad fertile fronds, similar to Excellence, Hilii Delight, Blumii. Um, and these species are native to tropical and temperate areas of Africa, Southeast Asia, Australia, and New, and New Guinea. This is one of the very large growing um, platyceriums, wandai. So I have uh, along my fences um, them growing. I have about 60 different varieties, which include species, hybrids, and cultivars. And you can see how different they're fronds are, um, they're, they're quite diverse. This is a superbum cabbage. I've been growing this for around four years. Um, it's uh, in people's collections and it's fairly new that it's been released. I'm looking forward for it to get much more mature. So <clears throat> the, even the ones that send out pups, all the fronds have spores on them. And when they mature, 
they get airborne and they tend they, they start growing in the uh, water dr the drainage portions of the of the pots and when they get bigger i take the bilbergia out and replant it and um, I'm going to just grow it from the hanging pot. So these down here on the left are ones that I've taken out and I've planted in sphagnum moss and they are doing pretty well. I just don't know what they are until they get larger and even then it may be hard to identify them. So um, the plant on the left and the right, the main plant is Tillandsia intermedia and it's hosting these um, Tillandsias that have um, growing on them. You can see I've got on the right a little larger, and on the left, put it in perspective with the in, with the intermediate. Um, I also raised cycads, and the blue cycads are from South Africa and are in the genus Encephalardos. Um, at the bottom left is a female trispinosis. In the middle to the right is an encephalartos horridus. And the largest green one to the right is an, uh, a ferox. The, the large one on the right sends out a, a beautiful red cone when it uh, decides whether it wants to be a, a male or a female. So if you look in the center, that's a, a, a female cone of a uh, my uh, Lamanii, and it's a very, very nice plant. So I, I hang Tillandsias with fishing line, and these are above four Mexican cycads because we have those um, here in the Americas also. But I use fishing line to hang my Tillandsias because it, it just doesn't blend in. It's not almost invisible, or it does blend in, it's almost invisible. Um, here's a large Dayun species that's uh, very, very large. Um, and orchids are a great partner to bromeliads and can be grown outdoors, and, and many are fragrant. Um, this in the next slide I show, you'll see that it, it looks, that it might be a butterfly or a moth in the lip here. And uh, that's a characteristic of the Miltonias. Um, Epidendrum orchids are easy to grow in your collection, wide range of colors, and they bloom in clusters, making sort of a bouquet. And they come in purples and reds and whites and oranges and all kinds of colors. Um, I grow some uh, Lelia cataleas and cataleas outdoors. Um, this is in bloom right now. Uh, this is from a couple years ago, this picture, but the, it's just a very dramatic cluster of beauty. Now, this is Varicia strawberry in my garden prior to entering it into the 2019 Culver City Gar Garden Show for our annual show and sale. And here's a picture. It took best in bromeliad show in uh, 2019. Thanks for joining us. Now, the following pictures are from our society's members' gardens. And uh, the, the first one here is from, uh, whoa, I'm sorry. Pat Gotcher. Um, he has about 40 years of growing behind him and mature uh, plants. Uh, you can see he's got um, cycads, and here's a nice uh, Alcantaria imperialis. Uh, lots of uh, clusters of beautiful mature plants hanging everywhere. Um, 
40 years of growth means that his plants in his front yard and his backyard have just taken over everything. And he's got orchids and a lot of unusual plants that aren't bromeliads. Um, just a wonderful garden. Um, this is Gary Wagnell's garden, part of it. Um, he has a real nice area to sit in and enjoy his plants in his garden with a brick pathway and landscaped with uh, ferns and bromeliads and other things that he grows. And he has a really small little uh, lath area for some of his plants. Most of his are growing naturally outdoors. Um, when you saw my Doradia clumps, um, I decided to do what he did a few years ago and put them in full sun, full south facing sun. And they're very, very prolific, although they're slow growers, but they're solid. Uh, Tillandsia nema on the right, the same plant that the hummingbird was sitting on. Um, he really, he, this prodigiosa, uh, has a very, very nice inflorescence uh, that uh, is a pendant one. It's really pretty. And one of his uh, favorite Neerogelias is Neerogelia Marcon. Um, the next group of slides or pictures are from the garden of Nels Christensen. He's the president of our society right now. And uh, the uh, Tillandsia secunda with the viviparous pups on the flower stalk. Uh, not all bromeliads or Tillandsias send out pups um, on their flower stalks. And uh, Nels is a real big grower of Hectias and Dicias. That's his forte. And uh, here's uh, some in his collection. Um, the Dickia Silver Cloud uh, was, I think maybe a hybrid from Don Masumi, maybe you know Barry. Um, he was a, a past uh, officer of our club. Um, here's a few I don't, others. He, I don't know if he made it, but he, he had it as far as, he had the main stock of them as far as a club member. Right, and that's where Nels got his from. Um, this uh, Mariner La Postolie I uh, is a pretty interesting one. They're a lot harder to work with in pot because those are pretty sharp stickers on the leaves. The one on the left is a hybrid, and then here's a Argentinian form a white form and the red form on the left. Quite colorful. And here's two forms of his, of a Dickia. Um, I particularly like the one in the lower left, just the, the shape and the barbs on it and the color is just a beautiful artistic plant to me. Here's a couple more of his. Well, we're coming to an end of my presentation and uh, this is the uh, Culver City Memorial Building that we have our monthly meetings in, which we haven't started back again because of COVID, but it also provides space for our annual show and sell. And you're all welcome and invited, and welcome to join our club, come to attend meetings or uh, be involved with our fellow growers. And with this, I will say thank you very much and entertain any questions or comments. That was a great program. Thanks, Ken. Oh, there you are, Nels. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry. As long as you show me a picture of this, just want to remind people they can find us either on Facebook and or uh, there's a number of ways to find us also at the uh, Permitted Society website, bsi.org slash new. So that, it, you know, eventually we're going to go back to physical meetings and uh, maybe some of the local people uh, will be interested enough to come find us. Hey, Ken, I had a question. You have an awful lot of plants that have uh, cups with water in them. Do you have a problem with, uh, with mosquitoes? Um, at, at times I do. So um, I, it's a good idea to clean them out, um, spray water in it, dump them out. Um, I was talking to somebody that says, um, get a five gallon bucket, put water in it, put some organic material in it. It'll uh, attract them to lay their eggs. And when you see they're forming, dump the water out and do it again. It's one way of controlling them. People put uh, drops of oil in the cups and that suffocates them. Um, but they, they're definitely a problem. And this year has been a little worse for in some areas for some people. Thank you. You're welcome. Barry, do you have any uh, thoughts on mosquito control? Well, I mean, uh, the main thing is if it's a relatively small collection like yours, it's a no brainer, dump them out. Uh, I like to run the plants dry. It's just my personal, uh, my personal way of doing it. You can also flush the plants. Anything that disturbs, you know, anything where you don't have the water sitting there uh, for longer than sort of 11 to 14 days, you're going to get rid of them. So, you know, it's a good, mostly in the spring and summer. Uh, but on bigger collections, I recognize people don't have time, nor do they maybe have physical access to many of the plants. So what I do is I keep some mosquito repellent outside and if I notice I get bitten, I'll just put some on and around my neck and ears and keep working. <laughs> yeah. But the issue is, you know, with their breeding. You know, this, is, this became a huge problem in Brazil uh, so many years ago. Well, and it still is. And they went in and even around Rio de Janeiro, they pesticide they, they killed with uh, all kinds of chemicals. They killed all the Alcantarias and all, oh, no. a lot of the native bromeliads. And uh, it's, it's an issue because the problem is we have a, a whole set of new diseases that are born by mosquitoes emerging out of, mostly out of tropical Africa. But you know, you got yellow valley fever, you got dengue, you got, I mean, this isn't a problem, but science is catching up. They've been releasing sterile mosquitoes around the world. And so they're battling back at this. But uh, I think if, unless you want lots of toxic chemicals around your house, the best bet is physical intervention. Dump the plant out. Don't let water build up. Or if water builds up, flush it out, dump it out. I know that suggests a lot of maintenance, but... Uh, this is part of collecting bromeliads. Well, when I water, I have a hose head that I can turn and it's, it's like a rain or a wand and it has a stream. So I'll put the stream in and disrupt it, yeah. let the water it's flow perfect. over. Yeah, it's perfect. Like Anytime you flush them out, you, you flushed out the eggs and then they're going to die. But I see uh, my son, Kevin and Keith are there. So hello to you guys. Any other thoughts or questions? <clears throat> I was cooking earlier, so. Thanks. Thanks. For um, no, but an interesting, something interesting that I was reading the other day is that uh, uh, changes in carbon dioxide in the environment, and they go toward a change in carbon dioxide. The mosquitoes do. Huh. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was talking to... Uh, the first slides that I showed over at Pat Gotcher's house, he was telling me that he uses hydrogen peroxide to kill insects. Um, it doesn't work on scale, but on mealybugs and um, other things. And a lot of agriculturists are 
using it because um, when it decomposes, all it is is uh, water and hydrogen. So it doesn't leave residues and it's really healthy for the plants. Do you know much about that, Barry? Well, it works on contact. In yeah. other words, you have to physically spray the insect and then you get some kind of reaction. It's not, it, it doesn't just work to go out and spray it willy nilly anywhere because it's not going to kill anything unless it directly contacts the insect. Right. But right. yeah, it, it's a, it's a, you know, it's virtually non toxic. That's a. Trying to think of everything. So, you know, the only other thing that we can say about the, the general uh, subject of the talk. Is that we're quite lucky, you're lucky to be in West LA. Our winters generally very mild. I know when I had my collection there, when I lived there, there were a few winters that went down to the upper 30s or mid 30s. But uh, by and large, you know, West Los Angeles, it, it's a vermilion blower's dream. If the temperatures are mild in the summer, they're mild in the winter, you know, you can get your occasional very hot days but uh, it happens to be one of the places where basically you put a collection outside and as long as you water it twice a month you're going to have a great time well the humidity is almost always above 60 percent right on the coast here right and that's most of west la or even the coastal plains even down in orange county you know growing to to Lansing is outdoors um they, when it's over 80, 85 degrees, they can be watered every single day. And they, I don't have any deleterious effects. And Pat uh, waters his sometimes when it's really hot twice a day. And his are, you know, really gr grown very, very nicely. And he doesn't fertilize either. The main thing is you, you got to be careful. You still don't really want to water any Talantia in the, in the hottest part of the midday. Not in the full sun. <laughs> Right. All right. <laughs> if you water them in the full sun, especially certain plants like the softer leaf ones, you'll fry them. But yes, they, you can water them every day as long as you know your nighttime temperatures aren't going to go too low. Right. Uh, and you don't want it to retain water in, where the leaves come together. Yeah, you you want the core to dry out. Very yeah. important. Yeah. This is why I stress to people: put the plants up in the wind, meaning above four or five feet. And let them get air all the time and water less than you think you should. And you're gonna have a great, you know, you'll have a great collection. You know, the currently, and this is just a private, private uh, problem. For, you know, me, I have a, a problem with the industry that's promoting Talansia. First of all, sold in glass bulbs. And second of all, they're telling people, oh, there's no problem growing them indoors. Well, there is no problem growing them indoors. If you don't overwater them, and you get a lot of people saying soak the plants all the time, they're killing plants left and right. These plants, especially the silver leaf talansias, are xeric, they're dry growing plants. Very often, from the dry growing areas, coastal oak forests of Mexico, the deserts of Guatemala, the deserts of Peru. So, they want to get wet, but then they want to dry out for a long time. I'm saying these, I've seen people walk away from their collection for three months in Southern California and without watering and everything is fine. You know, that'd be different if you're in Nevada or in Arizona. Yeah. But so it depends where you are. But the problem is by and large, the part of the industry that tries to promote these things as throwaway floral products, it just, I'm, I'm against it. People send, people send out plant growing tips and they say, take your Talansia and soak it in water. And like, I have over 400 uh, Talansias. There's no way I can do that. Yeah, and it, but it, it's not the right, it has nothing to do with how the plants actually grow. If you study where the plants come from in nature, and sure, there's a rainy season, but these are plants by and large, the rain comes in, and maybe the last 12 hours, then it blows through. And then there's a lot of drying time before the next storm. Uh, 
But the main thing is the air movement. If they get wet, it's fine as long as there's light and wind. The problem is when you soak the plant for an hour, you're basically killing it. And, you know, it's unfortunate. People misunderstand or they take this too seriously as far as, you know, what it is is when the plant is completely dehydrated and it hasn't been watered for six months and the leaves start to curl up this way in the axial in the axial line of the plant, if they could, that means they need a soaking. But that's like once in a while. The best thing is just to water your plants with a hose or a wand. You know, the, the uh, water quality is a separate issue. You know, if you live somewhere with hard water or bad water quality, you have to do something else like rainwater. But it's still better, far better, to water the plants. Sure, you can soak them in the morning with a hose. And then let them go for two, three, four, five days. No water. And you're going to just have better results. Okay, sorry. And when they do get water in tropical America, it's in the summertime. And, yeah, it's, it's and low also, temperatures. And uh, uh, very, very common for uh, afternoon showers. It'll be sunny all morning and afternoon shower, three or four o'clock. You have these thunderstorms. And then in an hour, then it's all gone. And the, the breeze comes and they even dry out a little bit during the night because it's the summertime. That's right. It doesn't go below 60 or maybe it goes to 55. Yeah. But the high altitude to land from Bolivia, Uruguay, and even Ecuador, once they get above 3,000, 4,000 meters, they're not getting any nighttime moisture, you know, appreciable. They don't get any rain. If they are a cloud forest to land here, then they tend to be the, the, the green leaf tillandsias that can withstand the water. But as far as the gray leaf, the xeric tillandsia that grow in the higher altitudes, they can go down to 25 degrees because the core is not wet. If you have a wet core of a tillandsia and you're a grower in Washington state and you leave it outside in the winter and it goes below 40 for five days in wet weather, you're going to kill the plant. Because it's just not what the plant evolutionized, you know, grew, uh, evolutionized with in nature. So yeah. it's, it's very important to have, if you're going to keep wet all the time, you got to have high temperatures. Yeah. I have uh, in the slides that I show um, the uh, tectorums and the Duratii, I water them. They're on south side, full sun. And I don't always have the most convenient times of water, so I'll, I'll water them even in full sun. And I've done it. You have shade cloth. You have no, shade cloth. No, these are like in direct sun. I've never had any problem. Yeah, that's unusual. Most yeah. most pectorums will absolutely steam like a steam broccoli, used under the conditions you described. Well, I grow and, my tectorum in full sun. No, but I'm saying, do you water it midday in full sun? No, I water no. it in the morning. Yes, that makes sense. I, I've, yeah, I mean, I've, I've done it for years at different times and I've seen no problem with it, but everybody says you shouldn't do it. Yeah, but that, that, that's unique to where you are. You're yeah. what, two, three miles from the ocean? So you've got moisture all the time. It's a different story. Tectorums yeah. come from very dry places in Ecuador and Peru where they grow. Yeah, we've if seen- they do our... get wet, We've seen on our presentations them growing on rocks and the only moisture they get would be from the dew from the ocean nearby. And or when they do get rained on, there's yeah. air movement. Yeah. It's so important. I can't shut it up. If you have dank conditions, uh, you have a higher chance of rot. That's all. You may not I, get rot. But... I agree. Now, what's interesting is Pat Gotcher who lives, oh, I'd say, less than five miles from you, let's call it four miles, as the bird flies, he virtually never waters, he told me, never waters his tectorums. They're up on his roof in the back. They're, uh, they open the uh, morning sun. They have shade cloth in the afternoon. He said, he said he waters them maybe four times a year. That's a year, not a month. Huh. So these are highly variable conditions. Highly variable plants. Everything is dependent on the grower or the collector 
using their brain, uh, where you place the plant, how much water you give the plant, whether you're going to fertilize it. But uh, well, um, Talanzia is like a breeze as well. That's what I'm saying. Up in the wind. Up in the wind is the whole ball game. I have one and, planted, but it has five heads. Yeah. And the other thing you'll find is that, for instance, if you do use fish line, transparent filament like Ken does, it's having the plant be able to spin in the wind, it turns out to be a huge advantage. I've seen plants grow 25% faster to Lanthius and all bromeliads actually, when they can spin in the wind. And uh, so, you know, these are plants, their entire life is based on gas exchanges. They're cam plants, that's Cambrian, oh God, I can't remember that right now. It's, just, it's the other kind of breathing cycle, photosynthetic cycle in plants. And they, they open the stomata at night and let the CO2 out, take oxygen in. That's it's true. the opposite of most plants uh, that, that do that opposite, uh, the other pathway, because it's called C3 or C4. But my point being that even during the day when they can be exposed to wind, they're enjoying and, and, uh, and benefiting from the, gas, the gaseous exchange, meaning wind. Okay, sorry. No, it's good. Thank you. That, that's what they mentioned in an article I was reading on the hydrogen peroxide that it, every, it, it may kill certain mealybugs, but the plant actually likes it. Yeah, it's, it, it's not toxic to the plant. I don't know if they like it, but it's not toxic. Um, I hear, that, well, um, I think they like it from what I read, but I've never talked to my plants. <laughs> You, you stimulate a thought. Um, when I was in junior high school, I did an experiment on phototropism, which is like the plant wanting to grow to the sun. And yes. I'm wondering that you're talking about hanging them and they're moving in the wind. Does that cause them to want to grow faster because they yes. were searching for the sun? Is that you think? You that nailed it. In other words, the kinetic motion and the 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 addition of this higher wind velocity speeds up the metabolism. There's no question. I don't know that it's, you know, it doesn't double it. Just plants, the plants are gonna have a sort of genetic upper upper limit to how right. fast they'll grow. Yep. Now, you know that a lot of Tillandsias, if you notice their growth pattern, they grow with a head down or curving down. Yes. And that's so that they don't retain the water down there in the, close that's to right. the body. And, and it's because many of those kinds of Tillandsias come from completely different biomes. For instance, Bulbosa, which grows kind of in shady areas next to rivers in Jamaica and other parts of Central and South America. But large, and, and you're right, even the ones in Mexico that, that tend to hang down, uh, it's to shed water and then the pups will grow sideways. But I have always found that in a, in the, in a, in a person's collection, the best thing is to grow a plant upright or to the side. And if it wants to grow downwards, it'll let you know. The pups will grow down. Well, when I, I, when I hang some of mine down, they, they do a, a U-turn and they yeah. start growing to the sun. And, and that's the phototropism. They're, they're, they're yeah. trying. But they're also, get this, they're also gravimetric. Talanzias are, they know where gravity is. And they know, it's a, it, it, it even beyond phototropism. So... They're amazing plants. They, they use something like one one billionth the amount of available uh, normal plant chemicals, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, to grow and to, to use to create their, you know, to have their physical life cycles than other plants on Earth. It's amazing. They're highly, highly efficient plants. <laughs>